I believe it's time to get started. So I'm just going to get right into it. So thank you everybody from Soil Food Web for joining, joining me today. Um, it's been fun, eight months that we've gotten to know a lot of you folks and been very successful. Lauren and I have uh, really enjoyed working with you guys. A lot of our team here has gotten to know. Uh, there's a lot of people around the world that we're dealing with now. And it's, it's different than our normal business, I'll just tell you that, because we are a, an FDA medical device manufacturer. And we sell to Cardinal, Fisher, all these big healthcare companies, these big distributors, hospitals, doctors, veterinarians. Um, so that's been our business uh, for many years. I've been working here 22 years. Um, Lauren on the top of the screen, wave, she's a uh, marketing manager. She's been working here 16 years, something like that. Uh, but we got a great team. A lot of people here are experts who have a lot of experience. But just bear with us, we deal in the medical world, the medical laboratory world. As you see, if you look at our website, we sell a lot of centrifuges and a lot of it has to do with blood. So we're learning about your uh, applications as well. So uh, today I'm just going to give you the kind of the basics of our microscopes. We have a lot of different microscopes and cameras, but I'm going to concentrate on the two microscopes and the two cameras that you guys mostly are using. Um, and the way this meeting is going to go, I'm just going to talk. It's ad lib. It's like we're in the same room together, just touching and talking about equipment here. Um, it's free form. And you'll see, I kind of try to use a process. I'll talk about things from top to bottom. That's, that's basically how I do it. Through this whole talk, and I'll probably talk for 45 minutes or so, uh, start typing questions in the chat box and Lauren is going to just kind of uh, compile all the questions. And in the last 10 minutes or so, or 10 or 15 minutes, we can just open the dialogue and Lauren will probably come sit right here and we'll talk. We'll try to answer a lot of your questions. Um, but we have limited time and I do plan on doing this again. So we'll do it once a month, maybe more often, but this is going to be just an overall class about uh, the basics. Um, and then you guys type questions if you have anything specific. We may not be able to narrow all the way down to the little nitty gritty on how do I, what button do I click on software. I'm not gonna talk about software at all today. So mostly it's about microscopes, features, functions, how to use them, and then how to uh, get your most out of your cameras as well. Um, reminder, we have a image contest that we started. I think it's going live right now, February, March, April. It is all you guys have to do is learn how to use your cameras really well find some very interesting specimens and take some cool pictures of it and submit them. Uh, Lauren has a, a, a page on our website where you just upload your images, give it a little caption, tell us what it is. And then we're going to be creating a little uh, gallery of soil food web and you can win cash. So we'll have first, second, third prizes. All right. Don't forget. I think your odds of winning are hundred percent right now because Lauren, yes. no, nobody has submitted yet. We're uh, day two of February. No, no submissions yet. So, all right. Get into the microscopes here. Um, this is the I-4. This is the Revelation 3. I think you guys have bought more Revelation 3s. Um, it is the, I call it the workhorse. It's our best-selling microscope. And in the medical world, I call it the clinical microscope. This one would be more lab grade, laboratory, like blood labs, hospitals. So doctors and vets, hospitals and blood labs. That's kind of where we go with these microscopes. So clinical level, lab level. The big difference here is um, the objectives, the optics. Um, this is more, I would say, standard objective, standard optics. It's very clear. People like the image. Um, it's not flat field. It's not infinity. Um, whereas you get over to this one, the, the main difference here is these objectives. Of course, you can see there's different style, different shape. I'd say this one's more comfortable. There's a few more features on this. It's more expandable. You can add a lot more accessories and that sort of thing. Um, so that's the difference in the two microscopes. Um, I always highly recommend the I-4, but I know everybody's going to be happy with a Revelation 3 too. So um, the cameras, the best selling camera by far is our Minivid Wi-Fi. As you can see, there's an antenna right here. Um, and then this is our BioVid 4K, which is our best camera. And you guys have bought a lot of these. I've been really surprised because it's kind of new. We just launched this what, last April, May. Um, about the time we started working with you folks. And there's been a lot of people buying this camera. Um, some people put the, the best camera on the 
lower price microscope. That works. That's okay. I, I think the, the best setup, of course, would be the, and it's also the most expensive, the BioVid 4K and the i4. So that, that's kind of the top of the line. Um, where's the fluorescence? Noah's in the room with me. He's going to be my helper. Oh, it's over there. Um, I'll just get that for me in a minute. Thanks. Um, all right. So we're going to talk about just parts of the microscope, how to use it properly. And a lot of people, even my uh, medical customers, they'll go years without ever learning how to use an iris control, um, one of the most important things. So we'll go through some of these topics. But starting at the top, eyepieces. And there's a lot I can say about eyepieces. Um, I'll keep it short. It's a 10x eyepiece. It's a 23 millimeter eye tube. If you measured that, 23 millimeters, pretty standard. Most microscopes have 23 millimeter eyepieces, so they're interchangeable. Um, some people like to buy upgraded eyepieces. You can get bigger, wider ones, that sort of thing. This is a 10X slash 18. You might have noticed there's an 18 next to that. Like, what is that? It's a field number. It has to do with how wide this eyepiece can see under each objective. A 10X slash 20 sees a little bit wider than a 10X slash 18. So there, there's some differences there. It gets a little more technical, um, but everybody's happy with the 10X 18 eyepiece. It's kind of the standard that comes with the scopes. Even on the hospitals, a lot of times get this. Um, but we do have bigger and better eyepieces. Even our innovation microscope that's not out here, it's, it's even above the I4. It has big eyepieces, big pipe. The, the, the tube's 30 millimeters. I think a few of you folks probably have bought the innovation, but. Um, so that's a 10x eyepiece, pretty standard. The eyepiece magnification times your objective magnification equals total magnification. Very simple. Not a lot of people ever think about it, but they'll call here and say, hey, I've got a problem uh, with my 40x, at 40x. I'm trying to do 40x magnification. I have to say, do you mean your 40x objective, which is giving you 400 magnification? Right? But that's not even the whole story. Remember, it's this times that. Something brand new just came in this week, which is really cool. And one of the soil food people told me, you need to get these 20X eyepieces in. Or just give me an option. Give me some 20X. And I've always said, yeah, you don't need 20X. Just get better objectives. Get, go up on your magnification here. And the, here's the, the interesting thing is that 20X times 40X objective, you'd be at 800. So basically, you just doubled your magnification. Um, but this is new, it's brand new. Like we just got in a bunch of them and this week, I think, and I tested it on the microscope and I'm very impressed. So a 20X eyepiece, which the lens is huge. Um, so I don't know if you can see, but much larger uh, lens and the image is, is beautiful. Uh, sometimes I worry, you know, with, when a, with a microscope, with your optics, when we talk about resolution, um, it's all about resolving details. It's also about magnification, but it's not just keep making it bigger. Because if I took a picture with my cell phone and blew it up to poster size on the wall, I, I won't necessarily see more detail. It might actually look worse, right? So magnification and resolving power kind of work hand in hand. So you can't just keep going, right? You can't necessarily say, well, you put your 20x eyepieces on with your 100x objective, you're at 2000 magnification. Yeah, but you were probably better off at 1,000 because you, you kind of go downhill, a diminished return as you continue to magnify. Are you really gaining resolution? So there's some of those trade-offs there, um, things to think about. But the 20X eyepieces are new. Um, I think Lauren's just put them up on our website this week or sometime. But there, there's a few of you guys that just really asked for it. I said, okay, we'll bring them in. And I am so far impressed with 20X eyepieces. Um, I'm going to talk about it again as we get a little further down the microscope. So we'll get back to magnification objectives and that sort of thing, how it all works together. So while we're up top, this is, this is a binocular head. There's no pipe. There's no third pipe. It's just the binoc. Obviously, here's a trinoc. So you can I always tell people when you buy a microscope, if there's any chance that you're ever going to add a camera, this scope's going to last you 30 years. You're probably going to add a camera at some point. Everything's kind of going digital these days, right? Cameras are getting better. They're getting cheaper. Um, there's a lot of ways to do it. Um, I have just put an optical adapter on my mini vid here. 
I'll show you this little eye tube. It's called the optical eye tube adapter. I stuck this on my mini vid because some customers, they just have a binocular microscope. And they're like, boy, I wish I could put a camera up here, but I don't have the Trinoc. Well, no problem. Add this little thing. It's like an eyepiece on one side. It's like connects to the threaded C-mount on the other. And pop it in. It'll give it a second. And there it is. We're up and running. Live image. I hope you guys can see this. It's um, my iPad going Wi-Fi to my iPad there. So that's the Wi-Fi camera. Um, Trinoc versus Binoc. Trinoc is best. You are ready for a camera. You can thread mount your camera. It's permanent. It's locked in. You're not having to do with it, the in and out thing. So, but this is a way that works great. So using the iTube adapter, it works. But if you're buying a, a package up front, of course you'll buy trinocular scope and a camera. That way it's all permanently mounted up top. When we get to talking about trinoc pipes, some of you guys are going to know about this. We have different pipes, different trinocs. Um, these are the two that go with the Revelation 3. It comes with both. One is a threaded C-mount. It's just, I always say it's about a size of a nickel. It's a little male threading, size of a nickel. Every camera I have, mount screws right onto it. So that's, cameras are C-mount threaded. There's my C-mount. If this was a Trinoc head, I'd have a, my C-mount trinocular pipe right there. I would mount my camera there. And this is a 1X pipe. Basically, I can stick my finger through it. There's nothing in there. It's a 1X. There's no lenses. Revelation 3 has 1X pipe. It also comes with another pipe. You might have said, why do I have two Trinocs? Well, that's an iTube that would be on your Trinoc, it would, so you can change it out up top. Why would you ever do that? Well, you can stick that optical adapter in. So there's multiple ways to mount your camera. So, so I could have that camera up top with an optical adapter. So maybe getting confusing, but I'm just letting you know there's a lot of options. So you can look at what you have and make sure you are, the most obvious way to mount the camera would be threaded C-mount. Um, now let's look at the difference over here. If the i4 also, what, it usually just comes with this. It's a C-mount. It's the trinocular pipe. I'll show you. Just like that. That's how it comes. So there's, there's the trinocular pipe. But look, I've changed. I've got a different pipe. So normally the i4 will come with this. It's my favorite. I like it. It's a point. There's a 0.5 in here, and it's focusable because a lot of the mistakes people make when they set the cameras up is they don't ever figure out how to get it in focus here in your eyepieces. So I'm looking at my specimen, but it's always blurry on the screen. I'm always having to refocus. You can adjust your camera height to be parfocal. Remember that word, parfocal, in focus at the same time as your eyepieces. So get this in focus first, look through your eyepieces, find something, and then adjust your height of your camera. Revelation three, watch this. Little thumb screw, adjust the height of my camera, okay? If you haven't done that, you're gonna be amazed when all of a sudden your screen is in focus at the same time as your eyepieces, so adjust it. Now on the i4, look, there's a focusable lens in there, so I can turn that and get it just perfectly matched on the, on the TV. Um, get back live. That's my blood, by the way. I prick my finger sometimes and make slides, so. And everybody gives me a diagnosis when they see it. So um, now I have the white pipe with my Bivid 4K. The reason I did that is because this is a 1X pipe and this is a half X pipe. These pipes have different, they're going to project a different size image to a camera sensor. All right. So I'm going to try to make this simple. Here's my little mini vid USB. We haven't really talked about it, but there's, we have lots of camera options. It has a small sensor. Smart would be send an image up that is reduced to hit that small sensor. Perfect match, the 0.5 with the small sensor camera. The BioVid 4K is a large sensor camera. It has a, you know, a lot of resolution, a lot of pixels, and they're big pixels, so you have to put it on a big sensor. Well, if I reduce my image, Let's do it. I'll just show you, it's pretty quick. But sometimes it goes both ways. I've had people want to go the opposite of what I thought they would say. They'd say, no, I like that 0.5 with 
with that 4K camera. See the black? I always thought, well, that's terrible. You don't want black on the edges. You, you need, we need to maximize the image to hit that big sensor. Other people, I think Wes, you guys might know Wes. He said, no, I wanna, I wanna see almost the whole circle here because I'm counting these colonies. I said, oh, that's different than my medical customers. So you kind of see how this is a matching game. If a big sensor, I might want one X. If it's a small sensor camera, the, usually the lower price cameras, the lower resolution cameras, smaller sensor. I might want to reduce it. So there's your little bit, bit of a teaser. It may have just left you confused, but um, you can call here, talk to me, Lauren, Noah, or anybody, customer service, Heather. There's a lot of people here that can talk you through that. Um, now, Re Revelation 3, we don't have a half X pipe. So we do have, ironically, half X lenses in this optical adapter. So there's still ways, there's ways to get your field of view different. You might say, I want more field of view on my screen. I want less field. Of, I want to see black. I want to see the whole circle. So I hope that, um, is that confusing or good enough for now? Um, always, okay, good. Thank you. <laughs> All right. I don't want to go too deep and go too long. Um, but there's a lot of tricky things about microscopes to just try to match it up and get it just right. So, you know, you'll see what you want to see. So we covered eyepieces. There's the binocular portion. There's the trinoc different trinoc pipes called a C-mount threading. Remember that all of our cameras will thread mount onto a C-mount. Some people have other microscopes. And the question, I wanna buy your camera, Mike. Well, what do you have? Do you have a binoc or a trinoc? Well, we have a trinoc. What's up top? Can you send me a picture of it? Because a lot of times they say that, but they don't even have a pipe up there and they buy my camera and they're like, well, now what? You must not have gotten this on your old Olympus microscope or whatever it is. So we like to make sure to know how you're gonna mount it, what's on your old microscope, and yeah, I can make that camera work one way or another. So that's the different ways of mounting cameras. Moving down a little further to talk about objectives, kind of the most important thing on a microscope. That's where the money, the difference in price, people talk about, why is this one twice as much? Um, this, these objectives, I'm gonna give you some words, I don't know if you have to, you don't have to remember this, but this is, let's say this 40X, is a DIN 160 achromatic 40X dry objective. You want me to say that again? It's a DIN, DIN, DIN 160 achromatic 40X dry objective. All right, let's, I'm going to go through these a few times and you're going to kind of start to get the hang of it. This one is a DIN 160 achromatic 100X oil objective. This specialty objective is a 100X infinity plan achromatic dry objective. Okay, words keep changing. All right, a lot of different terms. Here is a 60X infinity plan dry objective. Notice I'm throwing the word infinity in. And if you look down there, right, there's always four numbers on your objectives. 100X, 1.25 numerical aperture. That's the angle, the cone of light that it can gather. We're gonna cover that in a minute as we get down further. So second number is always numerical aperture. Your 40X is gonna say 0 0.65 right after it says 40X. That's how wide of a light cone can it gather, all right? Aperture. Third number. On this microscope, it's going to say 160. On this microscope, it's the little sideways eight. Infinity. So I'm going to scoot these over here next to the I4, right? So they're infinity objectives. Um, the fourth number, 0 0.17 is on almost all. Somebody, somebody caught me on this one the other day. I said, it's on all of our objectives. They're all for, for a 0 0.17 thick cover slip. Now, I know this has been like a discussion in some of your forums. Um, it's kind of an assumed thing. All the microscopes we've ever had are corrected for a 0.17 cover slip. To me, it doesn't really matter. It doesn't really mean a lot because when people look at blood smears in the hospital, they don't even put a cover slip on it. They can use this microscope, all these objectives, or that microscope, all the objectives. You can just do a dry smear with no cover slip. You don't have to use a cover slip. Um, 
but you don't want to use a thick cover slip, okay? The 0.17, that's the standard cover slips. They all, you know, your, your slide's fairly thick. Your cover slip's really thin, okay? Remember that your long, these, these high-powered objectives, the working distance, the focal distance is only about 0.3. So it can see through a 0.17 cover slip and see the specimen in focus, but not if you used some people say, I just used a second slide on top of my first one. I can't get it to focus on the 40 or the 100. Well, that's because they can't see through the thickness of that glass. So, so cover slip, that's that fourth number, 0.17, all right? So again, the 160 and infinity. These, let's say, optical system, either it's a DIN 160 or it's an infinity. And that's true with all microscopes, pretty much all microscopes out there for the last 100 years. Infinity is the newer um, higher end, all of your five, ten, fifteen thousand dollar microscopes at hospitals, they're always infinity. Infinity optical system. It means it's expandable. Watch that image on the TV screen when I do this. It, there, if I can get it, there we go. Look, I can hold my head, or if I can hold it steady. It, it doesn't change. It's, a, it's an infinite distance, basically. That, that's what infinity means. It means when the optical path leaves the objective, it's traveling parallel. If my head's here or here or here, doesn't matter. The optics are traveling parallel until they get to the next lens that's in the head that starts the focal points again. So that infinity means it's expandable and it's the high end optical system. DIN 160 is your traditional, generally the lower price microscope. Most microscopes that are a thousand and below are going to see 160 on here on these objectives. All of them are going to say 160. So that means 160 millimeters from this objective to this eyepiece fixed, finite. Make sense? Optical system. Infinity on the high-end microscopes, DIN 160 on all of the, you know, six, eight, nine hundred dollar microscopes out there. They're, it's just traditional. It's been around 120 years. So very good optics, very clear. Earlier you heard me say the word plan or semi-plan and acromat. Remember this, they're all acromat. What does that word mean? It's achromatic, without color, color corrected. That's all it means. They're all color corrected. It's kind of the standard that you often, I won't even say it. I would say, oh, it's got infinity semi-plan objectives on it. Correct way to say it. Yeah, it's infinity semi-plan achromatic objectives. I don't keep saying the word acromat because they're all acromat. Semi-plan means we take it up a level and make it flat, almost to the edge, meaning really clear through the middle, barely a little bit of a blur, way out at the edge. Let's call it 95% flat on semi-plan objectives on this scope. You can get plan objectives on the I-4. That means 100% flat, 100% to the edge. Who's that important to? If you're working in an oncology lab scanning slides for eight hours a day looking for cancerous cells, they're always going to have infinity plan objectives on their $10,000 Olympus or Nikon microscope. So that's, that's what infinity semi-plan or plan means. It means highest resolution, expandable platform, expandable system, flat field. So that, that's kind of the differences in the optics. So what about, I didn't say this was flat field. I just said it's a DIN 160, 40X dry achromatic objective. It's flat about 75, 80%. And the outer edge, it's going to be a little blurry. But for the money, that's fine. I mean, you're not, again, you're not spending eight hours a day scanning for cancer in a tumor aspirate. And maybe your specimen is a little chunky. Maybe it's some compost or some, of you know, you guys have, a specimen that's not completely flat like my blood smear is. So flatness, is it that big a deal for you? I mean, I, I don't know. I recommend at least getting semi-plan infinity on the I-4, um, but everybody's happy with this scope too. So there, I know it's a little confusing on the terminology, but you can go back and look at the brochures and you'll say, oh yeah, see those words are on the brochure. I never knew what it meant. Um, and, and always try to match, if you're buying a new objective, if you have an old Swift microscope or something, a different brand, um, Omax, guess what? This 40X, it interchanges with that. You can buy 
You can put an Omax 40X, as long as it says 160 on it, it'll screw right in. It'll be fine. They fit. These are standard fit. I can put, I can switch these objectives on microscope the, the, from one to the other and they'll fit, but they won't focus quite right because remember, Infinity has a different system with different lenses, parallel path, little different. So there's where the money is. That's where all those uh, terms are for objectives. Um, all right, moving down a little further. We okay on objectives? It's probably too confusing. I got uh, the basics of it, uh, just enough to make you wanna ask more questions. Moving down, the stage is just mechanical stage. I mean, it's obvious it goes, here, we can move it around, front, back, left, right, X, Y, some people call it that. Um, I always say front, back, left, right, because most people are like, which way is Y? I don't know which way the <laughs> X is. So, um, and by the way, if these ever break on either scope, it's four screws underneath, we'll send you a new stage. If the bearings fall out, it's rare, but if the you know, gear tracks are messed up in the bearing, if you ever have just wobble and slop there, just calls, all right? Lifetime warranty against manufacturer defects on any kind of mechanical failure that that's not I threw it off the table um, so any internal type mechanical failures you know we're going to take care of you uh, so those are mechanical stages they're pretty similar not a lot of differences there you've got a slide finger obviously you guys know how to do that you can stack two slides on these by the way if you ever never knew that you can put a second slide right there and it travels across two slides so all of these stages will accommodate two slides Here's something pretty important. As I said, a lot of people don't quite get this right. I'm gonna pull it out. The condenser. It's a, it's a funny question I always ask. What does a condenser do? And it's, I got you all muted, so I'll just tell you the funny answer. It, it condenses, it condenses the light. So that's why it's called a condenser, anyways. Um, so it has two lenses in there. We basically have light coming up from below and it goes through a lens and another lens because it's called an Abbey condenser. If we wanted to get more specific, that means it's got two lenses in it. Um, they're all this, pretty much the same. I'm gonna show you there's a little bit of a difference because the I4 is obviously a bigger microscope with more features and a little difference in condensers, but they do the exact same thing. So it condenses the light. I have a bunch of light coming up and I wanna pack it into this little bitty spot on my slide, because I'm gonna magnify that little bitty, bitty spot 400 times. I wanna get all this light into that little spot. Notice my aperture, I've now brought my light in, and it's gonna go right through and keep going, right? Depending on how I set my iris. So it's gonna come up, illuminates your specimen, and here sets an objective. Let me say, here sets your 4X objective, all right? Imagine that, here sets your 4X objective. Should I send light up like this with a wide open iris and send it through the specimen if my objective is sitting up here? No, the 4X can only gather this little bit of light to the middle that then barely converges and then it goes up and there, 4X. That's why the iris is so important. You probably can't see it. I'm gonna get a little closer, watch. Wide open, close. Size of pencil lead. That's the right setting. That's the right setting for the 4X on both scopes. Now this one has a little cheat sheet on it. It's got the, uh, it's got the indication. It says 4, 10, 40, 60, 100. So it, it tells you basically 100X wide open, 4X almost all the way closed, 10X mostly closed. Really, really important on a microscope, match the cone of light to the objective above. Here's the general rule of thumb. You might wanna write this one down. The smaller, smaller the power, the smaller the iris. The smaller the objective, the smaller the iris. 4X, almost all the way closed. 10X, little bit open. 40X, about halfway open. 100X, oil, wide open. Now I say all that to say I don't do that. I close it more especially for what you guys do. How many people do SLR photography? Nobody. Okay, has anybody ever heard somebody say to the photographer, hey, close down the F-stop, close down your aperture. Okay, why do they do that? Because I want you in focus 
and those flowers and trees. I want everything in focus. I want depth of field. I want depth. I want this in focus and that in focus. I don't want blurry specimen up here and focused specimen right here. I want to gain depth. The most important thing for that is this iris. So 40X, where would I use it? Depends if my specimen was some compost uh, tea and they're floating around and you know not quite completely flat on that glass. It's called, you, I guess you would call it a wet prep like they do on the medical side. Um, I'm gonna close my iris. I'm not gonna close it halfway on the 40. I'm gonna close it two thirds, maybe three fourths, almost. I'm gonna get to a point where I'm like, well, and now it's too dark and things start to get highly refractive. I start to see dust on top of the cover slip. You go too far, you'll know it. Turn that light way up, full bright, and use that iris. Crank it down, gain depth and contrast. You're gonna see more stuff. And it's really important for your camera images. That's where it's most important. You'll see more depth through your eyepieces than your camera will. The camera is a flat sensor getting a, just a two dimensional flat image. And we want to get as much as we can into that plane of focus, right? So you gain depth by closing your iris. And do I lean un over and look underneath my eye four every time? Say, oop, I just put my 40X in place. Let me set it perfectly. Nope. My left hand is doing this almost all the time. And my right hand is focusing and moving my slide. And this is one of the most important things I do all the time. I'm just playing with it. So where I think it looks the best. And then I'll look at my screen and say, yeah, maybe a little more. So that's gonna help you guys get better images and win the photo contest, all right? Um, Revelation three, some people never even knew there was a tab there, a metal tab. Open and close. Smaller the power, the smaller the iris, and just keep using it. Just keep closing it down until you think it looks best. Um, even on the 100X, wide open is proper. I close it down some, so. All right, that makes sense on uh, condensers. Maybe something new that you didn't know. Um, the lights on these, I would say, are fairly similar. Um, they have dimmers, and I'll show you. Of course, you'll see this one get dim. Now, as I'm dimming it, this iPad kept bright. You saw it kept getting bright. Now I'm come back full bright. So full bright now, you can see all this light come up. <laughs> There's no condenser there. It still focuses. Um, but if I keep cranking it down, my camera keeps boosting its gain, all right? It's, it's auto illuminate. It's trying to bring this image back up to where it should be. Boosting gain is not always a good thing. It'll make, tend to make your images grainy with your cameras. Um, so give it a, enough light, give it as much light as you need. Um, so it's kind of a balancing act from getting that, closing that iris down and getting that depth and contrast but not getting so dark that it gets looking fuzzy or grainy on your image. So you're gonna to have to play around and balance that. Um, but there's a dimmer. On the i4, it's on the side. You can see I'm dimming it down. Look, the camera, the camera brought it back to full brightness and it's not grainy. I'm gonna talk about why that is here in a second. Um, watch, bring it back full bright, watch the camera take it back down. Came right back to where it should be. This camera is doing that, and I can play around with that. I can change my menus and set it to where, no, let me control the brightness, or let the camera do it automatically. So, um, all right, let me go back up a little bit and talk about. We we got past the objectives, and I forgot to mention something cool. 60x dry. You probably haven't heard of it, but a few of you have bought these, and they love them because people hate oil. I do too, but it's been a necessary evil for a hundred years on microscopes. Um, let me tell you why we use oil and how to use oil real quick, and then I'll talk about dry. 100X oil, if I'm going through and I'm looking at my specimen, and then I, I go from the four, dry objective, no oil, 10, dry, 40, dry, and my next flip is gonna be the 100X oil, because that's how the microscopes come. They've always come with 100X oil. And you'd stop right there and you'd put a puddle of oil on your cover slip, just one or two drops. You put a puddle there. When you swing that objective in, it immerses, they call it oil immersion. 
your objective comes right into the oil. We've eliminated the gap of air. So let me see how I'm doing on time. Okay, I better speed it up. Uh, by the way, I have nothing else to do this afternoon, so I'll go along. I don't care. Um, so oil gives you high resolution at your highest magnifications with the steepest angles of light, that really wide aperture. On 100X, remember that wide open iris rule? I, I said you could do that or you can close it a little bit. I'm taking 100% of this light, wide open iris, packing all of it in. It's coming through this far into my objective. My objective is sitting right on the specimen, really short working distance. It's sitting right there. And that lens on that 100X, it's like a wide angle lens. I can gather all that light. But what happens at the steepest angles? You lose to refraction. The greater the magnification, the greater the aperture, angle of light, the greater the refraction. Look it up on the web about where is the fish. I always kid people, like if the fish is, I'm standing on the dock and it's right below me, where's the fish? It's a trick question, everybody gets it wrong. It's right where you see it, because I'm looking straight into the water and there's no refraction. Light rays are going faster through air, slower through water, when it changes speed, it refracts. Whole purpose of a lens, that's the whole physics of a lens. How does a curved lens work? It changes speeds and it bends, okay? That's how lens, that's how the whole microscope works. But at the steepest apertures, you're gonna lose a lot to refraction. If there's a glass slide, air and a glass lens it's going to come through and go er, like that you lose resolution oil is basically exactly the same density as glass it's like liquid glass same refractive index meaning that light ray those furthest out steep light rays come through that glass slide through your specimen through the oil right into that front lens on the 100x and up to your eyeball without ever slowing down or changing speed or refracting. That's why oil gives you highest resolution. Does that make sense? We've eliminated that error. So the, the fish story, it's when it's 90 degrees. Yes, the fish is still right where you think it is. But if you're looking at the fish over there, it is nowhere near where you think it is because the light rays bent when it went at a steep angle into a dense water and it slowed down. So does that make sense? The refraction of light, that's how the whole microscope works bent glass refracts it um, all right so oil i'm going to say it again it is the best for the highest resolution and the best objective we've ever had still today times three i'd say our 50x oil objective i think nobody here needs to buy one but boy on the hospital side we sell this objective it's one objective like that that costs 900 bucks and people say wow that's a deal i'll take two <laughs> you know, so the 50x oil is amazing. Clarity of oil, twice the field of the 100X and super high resolution. So I say that, but most of our clinical customers or soil customers might say, yeah, I get it. Oil is good for highest resolution under that 100X oil, but man, it's messy. It, it gets all over my microscope. I, then I accidentally forgot I had a puddle of oil there and I flipped my 40X back into my slide. My 40X just got drugged through the oil. That's a problem. That's the most common call we get here at LW. I can't see anything through my 40X. Well, it's probably dirty. And they always say the same thing. Well, I clean it every day and they just wipe it. So, well, did you clean it well? And I won't go into that whole thing, but there's a video, maybe Lauren can send a follow up, how to clean your microscope. And we sell a pro service kit. It's got it all inside here. Not enough time today. Learn how to clean your objectives, or better yet, keep your microscope covered and don't drag your 40X through the oil. They'll stay clean, all right? So oil is for highest resolution. They come with 100X oil objectives, but some people just say, boy, Mike, I wanna, I wanna get the highest magnification, but I don't like that oil. I said, I understand, it's messy, it slows you down. Here's something I like, uh, 60X dry objective, and by the way, it's an infinity plant, best, best goes on the I-4. Now you can put it on here. You can kind of go this way with objectives. It's better than going that way. It's, I won't bore you with that, but yes, you can put it on the Revelation 3. Um, and get some 20X eyepieces. What's the magnification I'm at with a 60X and some 20X eyepieces? 
you're all muted, 1200X. Is it higher resolution than me using my 10X eyepieces with a 100X oil objective? Probably not, but it's gonna be darn good. It's gonna be really good. You know, it's, I like that 60X. Now, remember I said 100X dry. People ask me all the time, oh, you got 100X dry. You mean I never have to use oil again? That's true, but it's not higher resolution than your 100X oil. I prefer the 100X oil. And then the vet clinic that buys these scuffs, they'll say, well, yeah, but we got 20 different techs that use this. They keep dragging the 40. We hate oil. It's everybody shares the microscope and it's such a mess. Okay, get the 100X oil, but don't think it's going to be higher resolution. Sorry, the 100X dry is not going to be higher resolution than your 100X oil. But it is a great solution for people who hate oil. Let's say it's 90% as good. So that's a way of, of getting high magnification without oil. Or 60X dry with 10X eyepieces. You're at 600. You've gone from your 40X dry to your 60X dry. You went from 400 to 600. A couple of 20X eyepieces, you just went to 1200. So see how you can play around with this? These, these are kind of accessory items. They're not part of the microscope because most people just use it the way it comes, right? But a few people have asked and um, I think we just shipped our first set yesterday to one of the soil food. I forgot who it was, but I'm, I'd love to hear back from them to say they're probably going to just use their 40X with 20X eyepieces. They're at 800 magnification. That's probably good enough. You don't need the 60X. I mean, do you really need to get to 1200? I don't, I'm not sure. Probably the 40X with 20X eyepieces is going to get you to 800 and you're going to have really good crisp resolution and close your iris. Okay. Um, I think that covers most of everything. I'm going to touch briefly on cameras. Uh, let's see how's time. Oh, we're in good shape. Since camera sensors, um, Wi-Fi camera, BioVid 4K camera, MiniVid USB camera, we have a couple of these, different resolution speed. Um, I always say this because most people don't get it at the beginning. It's all about, they think it's all about resolution. What do you mean this is only five megapixels? Or that blue, we have a blue BioVid, it's two megapixels. I'm like, well, that's nothing. That, I can get a 16 megapixel camera at Walmart now for 89 bucks, you know, or you, know, you can buy cheap cameras, but think about what we're doing. Low light, high magnification, we, you, we need a very sensitive camera with a fast processor, and what you're really looking for is big sensor with big pixels. Big pixels, if I got a big pixels, I can't put 16 million on them on this size, right? I can only put 5 million because I made big pixels. What's good about big pixels? They're very sensitive. They are very good at gathering light. You could put 16 million tiny pixels on a sensor and don't take that camera to the basketball game. It's not going to work, right? Don't try to catch, capture a little amoeba swimming by you know, the cheaper the camera, the, if you have tiny pixels and a slow processor, you're going to be struggling with slow, slow frame rate, grainy images because it has to turn up its gain and everything's a trade-off. Even with our cameras, it's all a trade-off. I can't, my, the best world would be highest resolution, sensitive and low light with no graininess, no gain, no boost. And super fast. I want to go 30 frames per second, like watching TV, just instant motion. Yeah, you're going to have to have a big sensor with big pixels with a big camera that has a fast processor. And you're going to have to have a connection that is a fast connection, USB 2, USB 3, Wi-Fi, uh, Ethernet, all these different connections. Which one's fastest? How many? Now, this is a 5 megapixel. That's a 16 megapixel. So imagine the size of this image. How much data? A whole lot more for one image. How many can travel through this pipe per second? Well, depends on a lot of factors, right? Um, so five megapixels, I'm hoping to get 30 frames per second because I want this thing to be real smooth, okay? So I don't know if you can see, um, but I'm moving. It's moving really fast with me right now. You know what I did? Actually, in this side panel, I lowered the resolution to about half. And I, it boosted my, my frame rate because 
if my images were gigantic, only six per second can come through. So it's going to be going. Uh, uh, uh. But if I cut my image size down, then maybe I can get 20 per second to come into the screen. And then you're, you even have a problem with how fast is your video processor and how good your device, how new is your computer? There's so many factors. So we're looking for sensitivity and speed and resolution. And it's all somewhat of a trade-off until you start spending more money and getting kind of almost the best of everything. And it better be a USB 3 port so that you can transfer a lot of those big images. Otherwise, that's going to be your limit. If you've got a USB 2 with your big fancy camera, you're still going to have a slow frame rate because your computer can't get that data through that pipe. USB 3 is way faster. This camera even has an Ethernet connection on top. Um, so there's a lot of ways to connect cameras. Now, the 5 megapixel mini vid is kind of the best all round camera at a great price. It's about half the price of this camera. This is our most popular. We sell tons of them. Everybody loves it. Um, but maybe not everybody knew that to get me a fast video, I lower my resolution. This little side panel, maybe nobody even noticed there's a little arrow right there. So I lowered the resolution for speed. What if I just wanted to capture one good image for the photo contest? Bump it back up to five megapixels, snap that image. Easy. You can snap one image, but if I want to move around and capture long videos, I'm going to lower my resolution. It also saves this a lot of memory if you save five megapixel videos. So remember the trade off. A lot of factors, mostly we're looking for big pixels and fast processors on camera so that they move fast and they stay crisp without artificial gain boosting enhancement by your cameras. It's like, you saw it do that earlier. Like if I turn this light down on this, it's still trying, but my image is gonna be a better image when I give it more light. Give it more light, it'll also be faster. Um, it's like an old fashioned film camera. This camera is saying, I need enough light on these pixels. It's low light, I'm gonna hold my exposure. Ooh. So it's like one frame per second when you turn this light way down. When I boost it way up, it's like, oh, plenty of light, plenty of light. Um, it's just like having that long shutter speed to expose your film on an old camera. The pixels are the same. They need to gather light. They have to gather enough light. So it will slow, cameras will automatically slow down their frame rate to help get a good image. So see how there's like 10 factors, right? Um, how much light, what kind of speed your processor is, what kind of connection. By the way, this mini vid, I always tell people that, does yours have the little pencil antenna or the butter knife? We went about a year and a half ago to five gigahertz. So it's five megapixels with five gigahertz, faster than a 2.4 gigahertz Wi-Fi connection. You should probably have that at your house. Go to five. The distance is shorter, so it's funny, a lot of factors there. But um, So that's kind of just things to think about with cameras, OK? Um, and Lauren, if you've gathered a lot of questions, come on down. She's, her office is down the hall from me. Uh, I have two questions. Okay. Um, she doesn't want to sit in this chair. Come. <laughs> okay, I'll be right there. <laughs> Here she comes. Um, hey, let's see. I can unmute everybody. Thanks for uh, sitting quietly like you had a choice. How do I do that? Manage participants. Hold on. I'll figure mute all. Maybe you can unmute yourself. Yeah, you can. You're not muted. You were muted at entry, but now you can unmute and talk to me. Anybody want to say anything? Yeah, I've got a question for you. Yeah. For, uh, I seem to always have my uh, iris set to full to see the most. It, I, I play with that all the time, but it seems like I can see more when it's set to max. Is... Am I doing something wrong? When you, say, when you say see more, what do you mean? More detail uh, or not more image, not more specimen? Uh, no, uh, it's just, um, <laughs> uh, they seem to be more in focus. Like I can see more bacteria, you know? Hmm. Well, that's interesting and the opposite of what I said. But <laughs> hey, like I said, play with the iris a lot. That, that's very interesting. What do you have, a Revelation 3 and a mini vid yes. USB? Yeah. You know, yeah. Which, which mini vid USB? We have two. We've got one that's a five megapixel, one that's a six, that's USB three. 
uh, three, I think. Okay, good. So it's a faster one. This one, uh, the one I have is the lower priced one and you got the one that costs a little bit more, but more resolution, more speed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you know, in your software, you can lower your resolution. It's got a snap resolution for when I, whenever I snap a picture, I want six megapixels. But whenever I'm viewing my live window, I want it to, to cut it down and you'll see it move. You see at the bottom of your window will be frame rate. And you play around with that, change your light. There's a lot of things you'll say, oh, the frame rate just went from six to 12. And, it's, and now it's moving a little smoother with me. You know, the, the delay is annoying, but that's interesting that you found that. Um, because again, I don't know your industry as well and that your specimens, Lauren and I traveled to a farm in the, North Georgia and hung out for a day with some, uh, um, some of the soil food people. Learned a little bit, so. Um, all right, send on Lauren. Uh, the other problem I had was with my 40X, it seems always blurry. The other ones are fine and I've never used oil. And I've watched your video and I tried to clean it, but uh, I'm still having issues with that. Blurry through the eyepieces, through the camera, or both? Uh, through the eyepiece. And better image on the screen for your camera? Uh, yeah, I don't think it's like it's, it's, it looks blurry in front of my eyes. So I think it's the actual, I, I don't know what it is actually. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I, for, I just realized I forgot to mention one thing that may, probably is not your issue, but these scopes have diopter adjustments. I am turning this pipe. Same thing here. There's a diopter adjustment. Binoculars that you take to the ball game have a diopter adjustment because maybe not everybody's 20, 20, 20, 20. You might have a weak left eye. So you can adjust one side. Some of our scopes have double diopter adjustments. Um, you need to put- My other lenses are clear. Yeah, and I'm just something I forgot to mention to people, but if, if your diopters are not set right, one eyepiece might be blurry because you got to get the height. You got to get them to neutral. So zero to the mark is what I always say. Zero to the mark is neutral. That gets this eyepiece and that eyepiece equal height. And then if I have to do a little adjustment, you reach up there and adjust it while you're looking through the scope. But um, that's a puzzling one. Um, we can talk offline and if I need to replace that, but let's kind of go through it and see if I can discover something first. Okay. And, and also play with closing your iris some because the I still contend closing the iris, if it's open any more than halfway, from that point further, you are losing resolution. Wide open, it's gonna look washed out, blur, and kind of milky, uh, not crisp. Um, that sounds clear for me. <laughs> wow, um, it, it becomes a bigger deal. Closing the iris becomes a bigger deal. Um, at the 40X, I think, but play around with it. Then you can call me or send me an email later and we'll figure it out. Great, thanks. Well, that was one of the two questions. Okay. <laughs> uh, and I came in here, I don't know if you guys already were answering this when I came in. Uh, Gail found that when um, with external <laughs> light sources, uh, depending on the time of day and the light coming through her window, it's your specimens look different, I guess. I don't know where Gail is. That's yeah, so hi everyone. So I just find that I need to to toggle a little bit with the with the dimmers and the iris as well, just depending on what else is the time of day. I just have different sources of light coming in through the window and it helps me just to adjust. So it was just an additional, it sounds as though I need to go into a darker space perhaps. That's to interesting to samples, me. But. I, I can only think of one thing that happens to me if I'm at a trade show in a big, big convention center with gigantic lights on the ceiling that light will shine right into that eyepiece if I'm not there blocking it. It will shine into that eyepiece and you'll see the light right here on the image. Um, so sometimes that happens. You don't, you don't want light shining. So sometimes you could get like a black handkerchief just hanging over that if, if you're only using the screen so that no stray light is going in, bouncing off of your condenser and your slide and coming up to your camera. Um, but that's... that's that's interesting because that's true. I mean, I'm looking at the screen and I'm looking at my specimen and I suppose I'm looking up and looking over to see my screen. Could that be when the light's coming in and maybe yeah, it's just, maybe the screen's just looking more blurry because I'm moving away. Maybe. And well, next time you move away, put your hands up there and look at the screen, you know, just block yeah, thank it. Thank you. And that might help. That's just the only thing I can think of. Um, unless you have some harsh light coming right into your slide. Um, from like shining from a window and sunshine. I, yeah, 
Y'all are stumping me. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> How many of y'all say y'all? We're in Georgia. <laughs> was that it? That was it. I do remember that I asked um, Noah to hand me a fluorescence real quick. Um, I want, it's just a little prop here. I'm not going to turn it on, but fluorescence. How many people, I know, uh, what, 10 or 12 of them have mm -hmm. bought, a, bought it? It's a really high-end thing. And on the medical world, they use fluorescence to diagnose malaria, tuberculosis, and all. It makes your little specimens glow, basically. It has a certain wavelength of light. Um, it has filters in here and an LED light. And it's like low wavelength of light that causes some things that are either we stain, we stain things with fluorescing stains, but you guys, I hear there's some roots and all that auto fluoresce. You hit it with 480 nanometers of light and then it glows at 520 nanometers. So you see these little yellow green lightning bugs in your, in your image. Now, if you guys can send me an image of that, that's, you're going to be up pretty high on the image contest. So, uh, but that's, that's a very high end thing. It's called the Lumen. That's just our brand name, but it, it's a fluorescing thing, and it only works on the I-4. You basically lift the head. Remember, infinity system. You can add things, and the distance doesn't matter, isn't it? So we put it in right there. You can see it on our website. And the question somebody will ask is, so why do soil, fee soil food web people need to do fluorescence? And Lauren and I will say, read what Dr. Elaine wrote. <laughs> we put it on our website, because it's beyond me. It is yeah. pretty cool. I'm really interested but I've never seen it. Uh, I've never done it. Um, so somebody's got to take some pictures and Keisha's probably going to send me some pictures. So um, that's fluorescence, uh, but you're getting up to a pretty high dollar amount. It basically doubles the cost of the microscope. Um, and we make this here. Uh, we invented this. It's used to be done with like a $20,000 system with like a gymnasium light bulb and this big transformer and it was mercury and it was hazardous to waste and it would explode sometimes if you ran it past 200 hours. These, these were all the old problems with fluorescence. That's why it was, you'd only find it in the big labs and the big universities. But now we made this so people can go into the uh, uh, jungle and diagnose malaria. And we can run it off a battery. It's 12 volt, like 0 0.1, 0 0.2 amps, 12 volt off of a battery. So fluorescence, it's low cost and safe and green. And so I forgot to mention that earlier, so. Just a little high-end option for the i4. Yeah, Mike, that's really awesome. Um, I just briefly to add to the fluorescein dye conversation with the fluorescence. Uh, my name's Adrian. I'm the CTP mentor for the Soil Food Web. Uh, oh, we've okay. chatted briefly, so thank you for your thoughts. Um, this is an awesome workshop. I'm really excited, and I see some of my students here as well. And this is really great to have. But the quick thought I wanted to share with you is that the additional piece of information we get is that we get to see within a root, there can be a lot of fungal colonization, but we wanna know where it's active and growing and where the fungi and root are actually exchanging information. So when we stain that root with a fluorescein diacetate, those living cells will take that up and then will fluoresce under UV light. So that's the additional. Oh, you are staining it. That was my question. Yeah. I was puzzled yeah. earlier because I thought you guys weren't staining it. There, I think there's some information that can be gained from not staining, but the active growth is the uptake of the fluorescein diacetate. Nice, okay. Yeah, great, cool. thank you. All right, any other questions about any specific camera microscope that you have? I got a um, quick question. So I was having a similar problem as um, was mentioned earlier about the, so the 10 and the four objective lenses are good, but then when you flip to the 40x objective, it's not quite in line and it's really hard to get it focused. And like you have like not even a hundredth of a turn to be in or out of focus. Like it's, you bump it and it's out of focus. It's really res almost like there's a defect with that particular. Okay, that, I, I follow um, you. Well, you know what I mean? So I was having the same problem as was mentioned earlier. And the way you explained it, I understand. Point. I understand exactly what you're saying. The more you magnify, the shallower your depth of focus is going to be. I mean, that's mm -hmm. just inherent fact. Now, you can change that iris and close it way down, and you're going to expand that depth more. So you might be able to give it a try. Have you been trying to close that iris way yeah, down? Yeah, I've been experimenting with it. 
I have it on right now, in fact. Okay. But it's just that because they're all supposed to be peripheral, right? When you come, when you flip them around, they should be pretty much in. Pretty close, yes. The, four, the 40X is like almost a quarter turn out or whatever. It's, quite yeah. a, it's more than the other ones were, and it's more than the other microscope I had earlier. A quarter turn on the fine focus, right? Yeah, on the fine yeah. focus. In my experience. So I just was wondering, maybe that might be part of the problem. It's just slightly not quite, you have to actually turn it quite a ways, like for the other question. Yeah, no, that's not going to be the problem with depth of focus. Um, now, those long objectives are spring loaded. So I always, um, first thing I check with people is to double check, don't touch yeah. the lens, but just pop. Push it in. Okay. Yeah, make sure it goes up and it pops right back out where it should be. If it ever kind of gets stuck over the years, if grit or dirt, or some something gets up in there and it goes up and stays up, then you got a problem. But that's a problem. See, this yeah. just pops out. I, I don't think that's the issue at all. Um, only thing I can think to gain depth. It, are you seeing the same thing through eyepieces and the camera, or is it a worse problem on the camera screen? It's about the same across both. I'm just not quite getting that. Um, just precise focus it's never quite perfect you know what i mean i never yeah. quite get to that point where like that's the place and is because there such that... little i guess i can't tur i can't um adjust it finely enough maybe or something yeah is your specimen really really flat or is it kind of something that's well it's that's even the... i even was just trying it now on one of these calibration slides with like the markings um one micron markings yeah on like a ruler I also seen you just got clear edges with no blue and red on the edges of that. And I wasn't quite getting it. So hmm. and I was I was getting it good on the ten and the four, but not the forty. Okay. And I haven't tried the hundreds. I don't like the oil. But <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I'm I'm again kind of puzzled by that. I guess talk to me later and let's see if we okay. can figure out I don't have an answer right now. I don't think there's something wrong with your forty X. I, I I just wonder if it's because on in our world with the medical side, our specimens are extremely flat. So that is the 40 X. I don't know yeah. how well you can see that, but it is a hundred percent flat all the way across. Everything's in focus. Now I can go up down and stop right where I need to be and dead on. So I am not seeing, and my medical customers aren't seeing what you're seeing, but again, you're looking at something very Hello, different. Yeah. different. Yeah. Maybe it has to do with, a root that's actually so big around that, that it's too too that big for it's the, like, yeah trying to focus on a basketball focus. you can focus on the top surface of it or you can focus on this side out here and now the top's blurry yeah that um i was gonna ask you could i you said um i i do have some 40x objective lenses from my old microscope but they're 160 so would that work just through the eyepiece because i'm not going to use the camera just to see if it I you get can, better results of that? Yeah, I mean, it may work. It may be a little bit of a domed, not flat image. Um, it may okay. be way, way off of par focal with the other objectives, but that's not, I mean, you can find focus. I can at least just see if. Yeah, try it. Try so it's it. Just, it's a brand new microscope, and I, I have never quite got it to work. So. Well, I'll keep on it. If there's a way of, uh, we have other 40X objectives here uh, that I can experiment with. Yeah. Or if I had what you're looking at i could put it on my scope i mean i can yeah i can i have the 4k camera so i can project yeah i can zoom with you maybe yeah. how are you can oh yeah oh yeah we could do that yeah. yeah all right let's do that in the next few, day or two um okay perfect where are you located i'm in new york oh, okay east we're georgia so yeah we'll find a time who else anything else thank you so much mike this is fantastic and yeah, team, thanks for being here, everyone. All right, well, thanks, everybody. Look, Thank you. Do it again. We'll send you a note when we do it again. See you guys. Okay. Thanks. Bye-bye.